Kyle Mills had 14 novels under his belt when he was entrusted with the Mitch Rapp series and the legacy of the late, great Vince Flynn. Already a success by any standard, Mills called upon every ounce of his experience to attack the daunting challenge of satisfying longtime fans and bringing Rapp into a new era. Like the man who writes him, Mitch Rapp must also draw upon all of his experiences and every skill he has developed battling both enemies foreign and domestic. But in this fight, Rapp will face something he's never faced before. Failure. Now with a nation draped in darkness and a people descending toward chaos, Rapp must find those responsible because they might be the only ones who can prevent total disaster. With total power, Kyle Mills is a man at the height of his own powers, weaving a story so genuinely terrifying, readers will want to sleep with the lights on. That's if they can. Gents, let's raise a glass. We have Kyle Mills in the house. Here he comes Welcome, again. Kyle. I don't have a glass yet. You guys haven't sent it to me, so mm. here we go. He didn't learn his uh, lesson last time. Jeez. Hey, Kyle, uh, total power right over my right shoulder right there it is your sixth Mitch, Mitch Rap title. Can you give us and the audience a 30,000 foot view of what problems Mitch will have to face and fight through uh, to overcome in this book? Yeah, this one's kind of an easy concept to get your mind around. Uh, a terrorist group kind of led by a crazy American guy um, decides that they, can, they figure out a way to take out the entire uh, U.S. power grid in a way that they can keep it down for quite a while. Um, and the kind of the idea of this one I thought would be fun with Mitch is Mitch is always the guy that saves the day. So I thought I'd uh, kind of have him not quite save the day and have to deal with the aftermath of it and see how he handled that. Yeah. Brutal. Brutal. <laughs> it was brutal. Yeah. <laughs> I it agree. Is, it's, it even starts off brutal. Like yes. Mitch is bleeding throughout the entire damn book. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a tough environment to work in, really. Yeah, really. Um, so, th really, the the power grid is. Um, I mean, it's a more serious issue than I think most people really realize. And I think your book kind of highlighted some of that. That this is truly up there with you know almost like a nuclear kind of scenario. Um, what were some of the more shocking or, um, you know, surprising discoveries you had when you were doing research for, for the book? It was actually, yeah, it was super interesting and much more terrifying than I thought. You know, I just, I just come off writing strangely a book about a coronavirus, uh, <laughs> which was really terrifying when I researched it and became more so, but this was, this was surprising. Um, first of all, how easy it would be in many ways. You know, the, a lot of reports have been done on this by Congress and other consultants and that you'd only have to take out about nine substations, major ones, to take the entire grid down. Um, and and, and, and Kyle, what's, what's, down, blocking those, what's blocking those uh, substations? What's, like, is there an army guarding those substations? No, chain link <laughs> fence. You know, they, and a lot of them are kind of in the middle of nowhere and honestly a lot of them became, are kind of not very easily replaced they uh, uh most of those transformers are made in foreign countries they're huge some of them literally were brought in on trains that the, the tracks don't exist anymore uh, there'd be no way to even bring them in so oh, Lord. kind of interesting and and interesting that uh they've done some uh kind of war gamed it a little bit and decided that if the power stayed out for a year uh, this is Congress, that about 90% of the population would die. So 300 million people, roughly. Um, and when you play it out in your head, and you know, I spent a year doing that, uh, that seems like a reasonable estimate. In fact, when I first did it, it was summer. The, the setting was summer. You see now it's Christmas. Right. And I had to change it because no matter how I gamed it, no matter what Mitch Rapp did, everybody dies if it happens in the summer. There's, there's just nothing that can be done. So I switched it to winter and it softened it a little bit. <laughs> Let's say softening it. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, with well, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. Right? When, um, you know, after you went through all that and you wrote the book, did that kind of change your own personal family plan for, for major events? I mean, did you do anything? Like, did you buy a silo somewhere or, you know? <laughs> I'm in pretty good shape. You know, I live in Wyoming. Nobody so, wants to take over uh, Wyoming. So <laughs> yeah, you know, I live near a river I can drink out of and, uh, mm. you know, the elk wander through my backyard. I'd shoot one. Yeah. So it would be a little cold and, you know, like uh, in the summer, like I was saying that, you know, if you blew all those transformers in the summer, then I probably wouldn't make it because that would start a lot of fires. And we already have a lot of forest fires here. So it would probably burn the whole state. Um, it would be incredible. And, you know, the violence, uh, you know, the, as people ran out of resources and, and the big one uh, is water. Yeah. You know, people don't yeah. think about the fact that water is pumped and, and, you know, water systems have a lot of backups, but they don't, la they don't last, you know, a few weeks. So after a while, your water just goes out and then it's kind of the end of you if you live in New York, you know, no water, no sanitation. I don't think I'd drink out of the river there. So, the East River? Oh, God. Yeah. Or the Hudson? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'd rather die. Yeah, <laughs> you would. Die. Right? You, would you, die. you would die. Do you think, hey, Kyle, do, we, do you think that uh, any of our allies would show up? Like the Canadians or the Mexicans or uh, the English provide some support? Well, I mean, you know, I thought about that, and it's kind of interesting. But, but the capacity so the canadians know because our grid is linked to theirs a lot so a lot of their country would go dark hmm. um i had in my book americans trying to jump the fence to get into mexico but the mexicans were stopping them all their border <laughs> <started dirty. laughs> um, that name is appropriate yeah, kind of funny uh and you know china even china would like to help us because you know, without us buying all their stuff, yeah. their economy collapses too. But right. with with the entire all of uh, American agriculture down, oh, yeah. uh, you know, they need to keep their food. And the other thing is, if even if you bring a ship in, there's no way way to unload them without right. power, and no way even if you could unload them, then you could cover the coastal areas. But there's no way to transport anything to the interior because you know you're not bringing in fuel you can't pump it out of the you know, gas station really um, yikes so it's it's kind of a horrifying scenario i mean if you really think about you know everything that power does it, you know it, it, back in the day even when you had the plague and stuff and things got shut down you know people tended to be you know subsistence farmers or whatever they didn't rely on a lot of you know, kind of the, the delicate machinery that allows 350 million people to live in the United States. Right. So, you know, if the whole thing collapses, uh, things don't go too well unless you do have your bunker. Well, you mentioned that Congress wargamed it out and knowing that they're so efficient and that they care only about <laughs> constituents um have they do they have anything in place or in planning stages of trying to rectify some of the situation as far as you know they have <laughs> actually been working on it they started a few years ago i don't think anything's really been done um Shocking. a lot of it has to do with cybersecurity because that's the other thing most people don't know is these attacks have already happened i mean they yeah. found malware deep in uh, power company systems, you know, that was sophisticated enough to give them command and control uh, of, they could actually flip switches and stuff. Um, that was probably Russian. They didn't use it. Uh, and also there have been physical attacks. There was a, an attack in uh, California that was very sophisticated. A number of gunmen cut power line or cut phone lines, went in, they knew what to shoot at and they took out a small substation is kind of, it seemed like kind of a proof of concept and no one ever caught them. Yeah. You referenced so, that. In oh, the, they were never caught. Power. Wow. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of a clear and present danger. I mean, much more so than, you know, I think probably much more so than say us going to war with China or, you know, Russia right. rowing over and trying to invade us. So. Well, that, that leads into my next question. So over the past two novels, lethal agent and total power, you talked about some genuine, um, and until this year, unthinkable threats. Uh, 
all, of all the threats you've researched and written about, um, whether it's the whether it's the loss of the power station or whether it's the biological or the nuclear attack, which one keeps you up at night the most? Oh, number one through ten are all pandemic. Okay. Um, really? That is absolutely with by a country mile the the biggest threat uh, to America. We've it's hard to say we've gotten off easy from COVID, but we've gotten off easy. I mean, it's nowhere near. Uh, you know, mm. it's not spreading as fast. It's not as deadly as right. many diseases could be. Um, it's not knocking. It, it, it's not killing people in their prime mm -hmm. and that, that kind of keep the country running. So if you think about, it's kind of funny that those threats are a little bit related uh, from lethal agent to total power uh -huh. in that if you did have a very serious uh, pandemic that was killing people, you know, between 20 and 60 at a high rate, then everything would shut down anyway. So yeah. not only, you know, who, who keeps the power on, who delivers the food, to the grocery stores who pr produces it. Um, and so you'd end up with this kind of perfect storm uh, that would be incredibly devastating to a country like the United States. Yeah, if you had an Ebola that was like 20% <clears throat> or something like that, and then that's, that's, when you're, that's when you're completely gutted. Yeah, or you think about MERS, which, you know, kind of took out primarily people right in their prime. Right. Um, and... I mean, I, I honestly, that one keeps me awake at night because you, I don't even know what you do. You know, you'd uh, I don't know, pull your yeah. liquor cabinet out and, <laughs> you know, watch the sunset, <laughs> try to, yeah, try to, try to drink it before you die. <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Well, over the last, or so you, you've had 20 books into a career now um, wow. in this genre, given everything you've talked, we've talked about, do you struggle to find the next threat? Do, is that, is that hard yet at this point in your career where you're thinking, you know what, I've done this, I've done that and I've done <laughs> the other. Now I got to freaking up the ante somehow. And, you know, sometimes, but the world always seems to evolve. So, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I mean, I guess that's a bad thing. You know, everybody thought, Oh, when the Soviet union went away, mm -hmm. it's going to be the end of thrillers. But uh, unfortunately, I think um, human beings are fundamentally self-destructive and <laughs> no matter how good things get, we're we'll always find a way to screw it up. So I'm not that worried. <laughs> this show is a microcosm of that. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason that career. reminds me, that reminds me of the matrix where the guy says, you know, we had this, we set up this great matrix where we had uh, humanity and everything was utopia and was perfect. And it, fucking shit the bed like, it wasn't good <laughs> yeah. at all so we yeah, had your it. minds couldn't handle it right, right? I, I think about that line all the time yeah right it's like the family that has to argue all the time it's a it's yeah. required <clears throat> hey uh so kyle to the to the delight of mitch rap fans it was announced in august that you signed a three book deal with emily bessler books to continue running the vince flynn iconic series was there yep. any any ever doubt that you wouldn't be at the helm of writing the Mitch rap series? Uh, yeah. You know, I, I the, one of the things about the Mitch rap series that's hard is that people love it so much the way it is. And so going back to what we just talked about, you know, the threats change, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we're evolving a little bit away from, uh, maybe from the, the Middle Eastern terrorism stuff and there right. are new threats on the horizon. Um, so the question is how much can you evolve Mitch and evolve the way the books and the universe works before, um, before the fans kind of push back and want it to go back to the way it was. Right. So, I like to write books that feel current that, you know, I find, I feel like are really real. It's kind of what gets me up in the morning. So there's always that question in my mind, can I think of a threat or that I want to explore that fits into the universe as opposed to trying to shoehorn it into, you know, writing one of my own books and trying to, you know, cram Mitch rap into it, which mm -hmm. I don't think would work. Yeah. So, I had an idea for three more books and I talked to him about it and everybody seemed to think it was a, it was a cool evolution 
of uh, of Mitch and uh, of the storyline. So it worked or, out. Really, if they hadn't, I probably wouldn't have done what, it. What are those three three ideas? <laughs> There's actually one idea. So it's, it's something I've never done before, kind of like arc. Oh, okay. one oh dude, that's concept cool. Concept over three books, you know, mm. which Vince did really skillfully, but I haven't done too much. Well, appreciate you answering my next question before I actually answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my question was going to be was during that, that three book, you know, discussion, you know, deal, were you game planning? And it sounds like you were a particular scenario. So do you, have you always thought on the horizon out past the next book that you're writing in terms of what kind of the, the next ideas might be percolating uh, for down the road? Uh, typically, no. This is probably the first time, really. Um, mm, wow. And, and because the, really the reason is simply that the world changes so quickly that, yeah. you know, I feel like if I'm thinking about that, it's hard for me to think about two things at once anyway. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, if, I, if I think about it, I think things have, will have changed by the time I get started on the next book to the point where maybe an idea that sounds great today won't sound great in a year. And who knows? I mean, maybe that my grand plan of, you know, this three book arc may come to, you know, come to grief here at some point if the, if the world sort of changes again. Hmm. So it's, uh, you're always hedging. Yeah. Know, with that kind of stuff. Right. Hmm. Is it, is it China? Is it North Korea? Who, who, who is it? No. <laughs> no. Honestly, but, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, that what, in a broad sense, what I'm interested in is internal threats because oh. I see, you know, I don't, I, I mean, some of these threats are interesting. I mean, I don't think North Korea has much capacity. I think, uh, you know, I already did Russia, which I thought, mm -hmm. you know, was an interesting concept. I, if people who haven't read it, I had, uh, essentially Vladimir Putin getting a brain, getting brain cancer and he's basically trying to cling to power um, which I thought was a realistic scenario to, for him to start a war but otherwise I don't think it would be in his best interest um, China same thing they're too interconnected so when I look at the United States I look at how fractured we are how polarized um, our politics have become how strangely susceptible we are to uh you know mean-spirited facebook posts from russian hackers and uh i'm kind of interested in exploring that and how the world is gonna that that's all going to change the world and yep. technology and, and social media and regular media and all that and how people are going to handle it there's kind of some some threads of that in my next question so without giving too much away in Total Power, fairly early, a sleeper agent plays into the plot. Um, now, we know Russia continues to meddle in our various affairs in different ways, but do you think there are still active sort of traditional sleepers who work in a fashion similar to in your book and in other pieces of fiction? I wonder. You know, it, it's funny because I, you know, I sat there and had to date that back. Like, <laughs> how old would she have been when this, you know, when the, because I think of the Soviet Union, it looms very large in my head, and then I realize I'm pretty old. And you know, some <laughs> of my readers Stop were it. born. Same. Yeah, I mean, some of my readers literally were born after the wall fell. That's so, ridiculous. Uh, it is ridiculous. So I can't play. It just pisses me off. So um, those Let's days on. worked. So <laughs> they did, but uh, I'm not sure. They, they're not going to work for that much longer. So. It'd be interesting. I don't think probably that kind of sleeper agent. If if those do exist, they're kind of coming to the end. It's probably coming to the end of that span. But I I found it a really interesting idea because I I remember my father used to have some friends that did a lot of undercover work, and it was really all about becoming that person. Yeah, and right. you could get sucked way too far mm -hmm. into it. So um, I think. Uh, that was something I was interested in exploring with this person who'd been here for so long, but right. they kind of you know, considered themselves sort of American. Yeah, they almost hated the idea yeah. of going back. Oh, man. Well, and, and I mean, you think it, it seemed like that would be a much diff more difficult sell to, to come over here than go back to that than, the, than vice versa, you know, to go over there and be a spy in the totalitarian. It, 
government and then uh, it's easy to come back and be loyal to America and that's it situation. But yeah. the other way around, it seems like a tough sell. Yeah. What, yeah. I mean, I, if you've got a pretty good life, you've had a pretty good life for 20 years in the United States as an American. Yeah. Who wants to go back to Moscow? Uh, I remember reading that and thinking there was a movie. I don't know when it was where they, they had like this town in, in the Soviet union and everything was Americanized and, there's a few of them like that. Yeah. yeah I, I remember yeah. just thinking of that. And it was, just, you know, it was just playing in my head. Like, oh my gosh, this person actually would still be here in the country. And like, how weird was, how weird yeah. would that be? Yeah. And then of course the whole thing changed too, which is pretty funny because it's not, um, you know, you had this whole shtick of you're going to America, you're going to train and you're going to go to America because they're the evil capitalists and we're the communist, you know, la la land and blah 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 and then then that like in the middle of her training that just goes away and they say okay but we've invested a lot of money in you now we're just dictatorships (laughs) that are seek power and we're getting rid of all the you know communist utopia crap (laughs) and then she still has to stay loyal to basically nothing like everything she's learned they just said oh never mind Oh, then that special forces guy gets busted for being a, a, a spy for Russia for how many years? Just yeah. like two weeks ago. All right. Oh, yeah. So, uh, hey, Kyle, uh, for the past six plus years, you've been immersed in this Mitch Rapp universe that I was trying to spoil for uh, some of the people who haven't read the book yet. <laughs> uh, it's a huge commitment, but do you have plans to write any other projects? Oh, maybe one day. Um, you know, uh, it, I mean, I'm having a really great time writing the Mitch Rapp stuff, but someday it'll be time for me to probably move on um, and let somebody else take a take a stab at it. Um, so hopefully at that point, I have some projects I, I think would be fun. Um, but, you know, again, uh, who knows? By the time I do them, they're probably all terrible ideas. It will be, you know, we'll all have flying cars and stuff. <laughs> do you <laughs> kind of... Kind of pile on Chris's question do you have any um interest in other genres like uh outside the traditional thriller you know I do I I would love to do some other stuff I've done kind of general fiction before Mm -hmm. uh I wrote a book that was about the tobacco industry that was in the first person and uh wasn't really a thriller so kind of a corporate thriller I guess uh it would be fun to do that but that would be kind of a retirement Mm -hmm. thing to sort of keep me busy i don't i don't know <laughs> being i think i have such a long history as a uh a, a thriller writer if i tried to write you know victorian romance or something it would be kind of hard to keep my keep kim, my fan base up. does does kim want to keep you writing <laughs> i i don't know you know i think it comes and goes it just depends on whether i'm just moping around the house with nothing to do and then she does Right. After the sawmill you go. Yeah. Exactly. There's been a slew of thriller series recently picked up for, you know, for film, you know, and series, you know, Amazon or, or Netflix or whatever. Um, just three or four, I can think off the top of my head and last, even the, just the last month. So what do you know about, or where, where does the mid rap series stand and all that? I know there's been some movies out before that I loved it. And so is there some more work in, in behind the scenes that we haven't seen yet with that? It's still kind of a work in project, progress. The question of, uh, you know, whether you do another feature or uh, whether it would go to like a regular television series or something like Netflix. Yeah. Right now, I mean, there have been a couple of things signed, but uh, it's kind of shut down now hmm. because of coronavirus. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's not like there's a, you know, you probably notice your, a lot of these cues, you know, I get that red box thing and it's all stuff that was straight to VHS back in 1980 that they're <laughs> dredging again. Um, Iron Eagle. So, <laughs> so there's not a lot of new production happening and hopefully, hopefully that's going to start ramping up again though. I'm not sure. I mean, my, my sense of the coronavirus stuff uh, is less that it's getting better and more than we're just getting used to it. So, mm, that's probably true yeah. well you mentioned things shutting down and are being shut down and you you come out with a book about things shutting down during a point where a lot of stuff is shutting down um how is promote how has been excuse me how has promoting this book been different for you and like what you know what what exactly are you doing that to to get total power out there 
It's definitely really different. It's kind of a whole new world. So I'm starting a yeah. tour. I guess my tour is starts <laughs> next week. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to, I'll be doing virtual presentations and mm. Q and A's and stuff with a bunch of independent bookstores. Yeah. And so every, anybody can kind of sign in, they can look at my website and show you how to sign into these things at what time they are. And, uh, you can, uh, you know, it's kind of nice because people who couldn't physically get to the venue uh, will be able to see them. Right. And then you'll be able to buy uh, signed books and get some other goodies uh, if you buy from the stores that are, uh, are hosting me. Right. So, in fact, I just signed 250 books on my kitchen table <laughs> for Poison Pen. And I think, I think my wife just dragged all like 700 pounds of them to UPS. <laughs> Must love when you the energy level has got to be different though, right? I mean, you're not in person. You're not kind of drawing off the crowd. So there's, there's some give and take, I would imagine, right? It will be different. I'm kind of, I haven't done one yet. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. I, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, kind of interview type things because I think it would be a little weird to try to do a speech. I, we were trying to decide how I would even do that if I should – pull the camera way back and pace around my room. You know, it's, <laughs> it, it would be strange. You got to wear pants. Audience. Then, it. I guess it'd be like the RNC, right? You're <laughs> they're trying to make an energetic speech to an empty hall, uh, which is a skill, you know? So um, it, it, we're doing some Q and A's like, uh, you know, Jack Carr is going to help me out. Brad Thor is going to help me out. And we're going to do some things like that. Cause I think that'll be fun. And it's a lot, those kinds of, yeah. so the B team, the B team, yeah. The B team, yeah. The new firepower. guys. Um, no firepower. <laughs> new guy. hey, Kyle, do you, do you, uh, you know, thinking ahead, cause you haven't actually done it yet. Do, would you prefer doing that? Or do you want to get on the plane and drudge around the country to, to meet everybody? I mean, that's fun. I mean, I don't know that I'd want to do it now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll be not. Yeah, there's so many things that when coronavirus is gone, you, you don't you don't think about how much you enjoyed, uh, you know, that interaction with fans and getting around the country and, mm -hmm. and seeing people. So, yeah, you, you, know, you think next after year, hopefully you think after everything gets back to whatever normal becomes um, that there will be like a hybrid of what we're doing now and what you did before. So, so I mean, yeah. some of these online events seem to be picking up steam and might be a really good ancillary, you know, addition to what you're doing. Yeah. I think so. Because like I said, you know, a lot of people can't get to the venues. I mean, yeah. there are so many people that have asked me to go to so many towns that, you know, you just couldn't get to all of them. Right. So um, this is a great way for people to dial in. They can watch it. They can ask questions um, and they can get their signed books. It's just, you know, they'd be shipped. They'll be shipped out to them. So I well, think, you do, yeah, you're going to see a hybrid of it though. Hopefully you make it won't, it the, the whole in-person thing won't go away entirely. Yeah. Well, if you do make it to the Kokomo books, a million, um, I got a, a fully stocked bar here for you to entertain you. After this. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I would love that. Uh, so we were talking about the B team before, uh, Jack Carr and Brett Thor. Um, there are some who call this the golden age for thrillers. Uh, but I'd love to hear your, your take on the current thriller landscape. Do you think it's oversaturated with talent or is there room for it to grow? You know, people really have an insatiable appetite for these stories. And we're lucky now that we have so many good authors working. Um, I have to admit that if I'd have been born a little earlier, I wouldn't have been upset because I love the uh, Soviet era thrillers. Right. He had such a cool yeah. opponent that was so sophisticated and every scenario was just world ending, you mm -hmm. know, they, they were going to take Tom over Clancy. freedom. Yeah. Clancy and, yeah. <clears throat> you know, Le Carre and, and Ludlum and all those guys. So if that, to me, that was just an amazing, would have been an amazing time to be a thriller writer. And, you say, would you ever do another a project on your own? You know, maybe it'd be fun to go back and do, you know, a historical thriller. You know, oh, from, yeah. from, I don't know, you know, the Soviet Union uh, era or or even like World War II, where you know, everything's so grand. Sort of in the um, Joseph Cannon um, era. Yeah. Yeah, it, and I I don't know. I mean, I don't know that I, if I'd ever really do it, but because it's fun to do the current stuff. Um, you know, what's the next threat around the corner? 
Um, but that to me that I do love those books. I love reading the Tom Clancy and Ludlum stuff. Yeah. Hey boys, let's raise a glass. Uh, Kyle Mills has completed for the second time, the traditional portion of our interview. Cheers to you, sir. That was wow. easy. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and now we're going to move on to what we call the lightning E N I N G round of questions. Right, Sean? All right. Is that how we spell it? It is. But before we do that, should we ask Kyle if he has any more Africa cab stories? Oh my gosh, yes, do you? <laughs> what? Driving driving a cab being a cab driver in Africa? I'm not sure. Oh, oh, you mean like the where we picked up the hitchhiker? Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. Nice. Oh, yeah, yeah but so we, okay, we okay. Oh, but it African. wasn't a cab, it was no, a we, car. We, oh, we okay. jokingly yeah, yeah, called yeah. you an African cab driver <laughs> because before We did that in Argentina too, by oh, Argentina. Okay. You did oh, that in Argentina? No, it was Africa. No, my yeah, my my wife, the, her Spanish wasn't very good, and the guy asked if if he was like a an off duty cop, and he asked if uh, he could have a ride, and she thought he was asking for her for like the registration of the car. <laughs> she said yes, and I'm like, huh? And he got in. He got in. <laughs> we so thought I'm gonna go. go. Yeah, we thought he was going to kill us. Yeah. Too. Ecuador, please. <laughs> yeah, okay, so it was South America. If I, if I got no, that. no, no, no. That happened to us. That happened to us in Africa too. Yeah. Oh, okay. What's, but what's that one—that one, was, was my fault. That one was my fault. So if, if this writing like thing doesn't work out, two kids in the desert, like in the middle of the desert, and I thought, oh my god, they're going to die out. It was like 140 degrees in the middle of the desert. We got to pick them up, and it yeah, turns out they lived there. <laughs> That's uh, normal for them. Yeah, it was, and they didn't need a ride. It was like their their dad. <laughs> We've been kidnapped by Americans, yeah. and they had a, a a wooden box with a chicken in it. I have no idea why. why. There's always chickens. It's always yeah, jokes there oh, somewhere. There. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here I'm going to ask uh, Kyle Mills three questions. Uh, each of us are going to ask you three questions. Uh, stream of consciousness. So, <clears throat> first thing that pops into your head. Here we go. Kyle, what's the most frustrating thing about the editing process? Oh, the, I, I think just the, the every once in a while I get into real battles and because uh, I, I, I have something in my head and it's just the way I wanted it. And in the end, you know, it probably isn't, it wasn't as good as I thought it was. <laughs> so does that mean you don't win and the editor wins out? <laughs> I'd put it at 50-50. Oh, that's pretty good for a writer. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, I'd say right around there. Uh, mm. All right. So now, no thinking on this part. All right. I want I, you to put on your, your musical cap <laughs> for a second and tell us the first song title that pops into your mind. Go. Uh, Paranoid Android. That's the next title of his book, I think. Yeah, that would be good. We're going to have a psychologist analyze that. The yes. other writer came up with Paranoid Android. Immediately. <laughs> it was like, this is what it is. Mm. Um, all right, and the last one that I have for you. What's one thing, and you can't say children, that you should never put ketchup on? Uh, ice cream. Ice cream. Ooh. Oh, okay. I not thought about that. Yeah, that's oh, kind of brutal. Weird. Are you thinking you should? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm thinking no. about how disgusting that is. <laughs> no. <be> really weird. <laughs> uh, hey, Mike, you're up, buddy. All right, here we go. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's say that the scenario in total power actually plays out and we lose a power grid. Which famous person's home in Jackson Hole do you raid first? Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Harrison Ford. For sure. Oh, there you go. Really? Get the Han Solo. Got a lot of, like horses and stuff. You could just ride across the, the tundra. I think Dick Cheney still got a, a place there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He lives in. Uh, he just kind of lives in this little in this gated community over by the golf course. Though I had some picture riding out Armageddon next to a golf course. <laughs> Takes the Except edge water. off. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I could play some golf. So maybe that would. <laughs> Um, okay, number two. In your research for Total Power, did you ever come across any good or interesting recipes? Hmm. No, it's all canned. Canned food. <laughs> it's canned beans, dried beans, beans. Oh, man. I was like, I, I read hash, and I was like, man, I haven't had that since I was like eight years old. That sounds kind of good about right now. 
Yeah, there's a lot in that book about. I know. Beans. I'm like, yeah. guy grew up. That like would have been a good title. Dried <laughs> beans and a nice Mitch Robinson Earl. or a band name. End of the World Cookbook is like something we should think, talk about. We, uh, I could, I could lend a hand with uh, carving up that body. You should. Uh... <laughs> <That's perfect. laughs> All right, number three. You can only pick one: wind or solar. Uh, solar. Oh, because he lives in the sunny part of the country. I was going to say, is it snowing by you there, Mike? <laughs> yeah, right, what's going on right now? That's ridiculous. I know. I got sunburned yesterday. You can see it in my face. All right, Sean Cameron is up for cleanup. Okay, mine's. I guess you could say this tangential to total power. So, because of food scarcity, you can only eat one dish for the next five years. What is that dish? Tacos. 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 Let's think of the same thing. It's Tuesday, baby. Come on. <laughs> For me, it's sushi, but I'm not thinking about it. Mm. Um, so, you know, without refrigeration, though. That's oh, that's true. That's true. Good point. Good Worst point. tacos. Here we go. Yeah. I'm assuming I live on the coastline and I'm just every day. I'm catching a yellowtail. <laughs> Mahi. <be> all, right. <laughs> all right. So you graduated in the late 80s, which meant you were in high school during the new wave pop era, the MTV era. So what was the worst haircut or outfit Kyle Mills wore in that era? <laughs> and there's pictures. I never had a good, uh, my hair's kind of always been sort of. No way. Like you didn't have a mullet. Come on. I did not. No. I played in a punk band though. Mohawk? Uh, we no, no mohawk. We didn't, I, I, I just was never a good fashion guy. Okay. And I, I so what'd you wear when you performed? A sock. puffy shirt? Yeah, like, like a I, like I, I shirt. remember seeing a picture of me performing and I had like a pink Oxford shirt on and a pair of shoes. <laughs> so you were a true rebel in that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like I didn't fit in at all. It was really funny to see me at these punk shows and then people found thought, who's this weirdo? And then I was, I was playing. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Khaki, well, Oxford, Penny Lowe. Well, I, got, I guess I got to open that question up. Mike, what was the most embarrassing thing you wore or hairstyle? Oh, hairstyle, no. But I, in, Chaps. in my heyday, in my heyday, when we were touring, I was wearing a, a, a sequined denim vest. And I still have it. <laughs> I've seen Is that, that up on our website? I've yep. seen that picture. It might be on the website. <laughs> I think it's on our website. <laughs> Chris, what about you? Yeah. Uh, I had a mullet. Yeah, that oh, boy. Oh, nice. boy. Yeah. I looked good, though. Come on. That will be on our website soon. <laughs> I mean, the girls loved it. I loved it. Mm. But when I was I at did. I, I, worked at a, I worked at a video club. I had to dress up. So I did have one of those really skinny, like, what are they, like, crocheted ties. Remember those? Oh, yeah. Oh, Kevin sure. Bacon. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> that was the Kevin Bacon. Uh, po- yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, hey, Sean, I had an old school uh, baseball coach. And uh, he didn't like, you know, it was like Don Mattingly. You can't have long hair. So I had to, I had to take my hair in the back because it was all business up front. And I take the hair in the back and put it up in my hat. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> I guess, I guess mine would be, uh, I had a bunch of, I had like three of the Miami, the Don Johnson sort of like, a, a, what's it? Light colored, like colored uh, sport coats. A and jacket. Yeah. Multiple colored uh, t-shirts. So. Shoulder pads. No, no, no shoulder pads. I didn't need those, but I was the very uh, Miami Vice in Indiana. There's nothing like it. <laughs> okay, my, my last question. <laughs> what? You <laughs> embrace outdoor adventure in your life, whether it be rock climbing or backcountry skiing or mountain biking. What is one outdoor activity that you have not yet done that you would like to try or would have liked to have tried when you were younger? Mm. Uh, I've always kind of wanted to skydive. Oh, I, I, I guess that'd be, that's an outdoor activity, kind of. Yeah, and for sure. I may do it one day. I, it's funny. I had a chance. No. I kind of had a chance to do it. A, a friend of mine was in the special forces. This is back when I was in high school, and uh, he was going out with kind of the his his team and asked me. This is what a friend of my dad's actually, and and uh, asked me if I wanted to go, but. I don't know. I'd see 
that seemed a little hardcore for my first <laughs> shot, right? The, the high school kid goes in with the recon Marines and they yeah. get a thing and I seem to pack in the helmet and they shove me out. I was like, what if I, what right if I get scared and I don't want to go? <laughs> you have to eat a cobra before you do it, yeah. <clears throat> now you're going to jump out without so, a parachute, but I'm going to catch you and we're going to... Oh, my God. Yeah. Hey, Mike, this have you skydived? Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, have I, you? I, I, highly recommend yeah. it, man. I, you know, it's funny. Really, I, I wanted cool. to until I had kids. And then the moment, like, somebody else was responsible for me, or I was responsible for somebody <laughs> else, both, probably, um, I was like, yeah... <laughs> I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait at least till they don't need me anymore, which is probably like years ago. And I'm just in denial. <laughs> That's just an excuse. They keep saying, you know, you should really go. Parachuting. <laughs> Dad, what's your premium? What's, what's a <laughs> million, million dollars. We, we get a piece of that we'll find a discount. Uh, I'll pack your shoot, dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kyle, you, you've actually. Kyle, said, yeah. Like, Kyle, Kyle, we thank you for coming on again. Uh, Total Power is a fantastic novel. Oh, this was so fast reading. I, it was awesome. It is super fast reading. We yeah. loved it. We love Mitch Rapp. We love you, dude. You are an awesome writer. You're an awesome mm -hmm. guy. Thank you. I'm raising this, glass this, to you, sir. This, by the way, is, in my opinion, top three Mitch Rapp, period. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Dude, probably, top good. Yeah. probably top two. Um, yeah, this, is, this was your best for sure. Oh, What's your favorite? Of all the, of the well, movies. like when I say top two or top three, I don't know that I have a favorite, mm, but um, no, uh, goodness. And of course, you had to ask me the title. I'd say American but Assassin is for he's me. In the, he's in the White yeah. House, um, in all the different corridors. It's very early, it might be the first uh, transfer, yeah. transfer, of power. Transfer, yeah, transfer of power, transfer power, yeah, transfer power is up there, but then that one's great the for me. Option. For me and like all the people that are always complaining on you to, to end the trilogy, I, I think American Assassin um, struck a chord with me as well. <clears throat> but this one hit me, man. I, I love this story. Well, this I, is so I, timely, I think. It, it, I think it this is. is very timely. Hopefully it, not. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, but <laughs> it got me. Out of the way. But I love to read like those EMP attack stories um, where like everything goes to shit and everyone's scrounging and people come together. And, but, and when Mid, Mitch Rapp is, is front and center of it, it makes it so much better. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, to, to me, it, like, my palms were sweating at different times when I read it. And that's, I mean, sometimes you get into a book and it's so visceral, the, the idea is so visceral that even though you know it's fiction, it, it plays in your mind. I remember for at least three or four nights, I had weird dreams after reading it. So people buy, buy Total Power and have weird dreams. That's yeah, my yeah, But I, I, I shit you not that, Kyle, that three book deal should have been a six book deal because you're the guy. Well, Cheers. thank you. I appreciate it. I'm glad you guys are liking the book. You bet. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Boys, Kyle Mills was on the show, author of uh, Total Power, the sixth Mitch Rapp novel he has written for the franchise. Kyle's awesome. Crew Reviews is awesome. Sean, Mike, me, we're awesome. I want to thank everybody for watching our show. We're going to raise a glass for Kyle Mills. Raise up that crew reviews glass. There you go, Mike. Come on, put it up there. Ooh, right there. I got to finish this last drop. Boys, congrats. Kyle Mills, congrats. Mm. And we'll see you next Monday on Crew Reviews, the best damn podcast. In the Cheers. Cheers to that. a drink here you should have a don't lot don't spotlight of like me please yeah, don't put it on everybody no outro guy this is the outro for kyle mills and sean and my are watching a train wreck about to happen here it comes down the tracks i started drinking too soon it was a busy day first day of school oh there's the reason right there i'm so bad, <laughs> so bad. Oh my gosh. What are we doing? <sighs> We're doing the outro. Oh my gosh. Hey this boys. Is the outro. And the outro. wait, no. I gotta Come say on. it correctly. And yeah.